Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Rosen Apostolov and I will be the host of today's event. Before we start, I have a few announcements to make. The first one is that we are recording this webinar and uh, recording will be put on the BioXL website which you could uh, watch later or um, forward to your colleagues. And uh, at the end of the webinar, we will have a questions and answer session when uh, you can ask uh, any questions that you have to mark. Uh, I will take the questions in order and I will give you the microphone. If we have problems with the audio, then I will read the question on your behalf. This uh, uh, webinar series are uh, organized by BioXL, Center of Excellence for Computational Biomolecular Research, which is a new project that started uh, last year. And I would like to give you a small overview of the center, since we will be doing a lot of future events uh, regarding computational biomolecular research. So BioXL is... Uh, uh, is working with three uh, widely used codes for molecular simulations and modeling. One of them is Gromax, that um, I hope you're very familiar with. Another one is Haddock. Uh, for those of you who have done docking, it's also a very popular software. And also CPMD, which is used for um, electronic structure studies, specifically hybrid QMM studies of enzymatic reactions. And BioXL is working on improving the performance, efficiency, and scalability of those codes. In addition to working with the software, the center works with experts uh, in several popular workflow uh, environments and platforms, such as uh, Galaxy, Comps, Apache Taverna, and others. Uh, we have several um, uh, sub-projects where we are combining tools like Gromax and Haddock with uh, external databases to automate and optimize the work of researchers. BioXL is also uh, working uh, towards uh, training pro and promotion of best practices among academia and industry on how to best take advantage of the powerful applications um, and make the, the best of your work. And this webinar series are part of our efforts in uh, spreading the knowledge. As part of this work, BioXL is starting with several interest groups on uh, different topics of uh, biomolecular research that some of those might be of interest to you. Uh, we have groups on integrative modeling, which is mostly docking. Uh, free energy calculations using Gromax. We'll have a webinar on that as well uh, in about a month. Best practices for performance tuning. Today's webinar is uh, specifically on that topic. Uh, we'll have an interest group on hybrid methods for biomolecular systems, which will include QMMM and also coarse grained modeling. We have also an interest group on uh, biomolecular simulations for entry level users which is very useful for those of you who are just starting with uh, such simulations. And we also will have a group on practical applications for industry. Since uh, all three codes are used in uh, dozens of companies uh, in pharma and also food industry. BioXL uh, provides several platforms for support. Uh, you can learn more about this from our website and on BioXL dot eu slash contact uh, there are links to our forums ask.bioxl.eu where you can uh, put questions regarding the codes uh, we, we have a good, uh, github repository where um, we will put newly developed code and uh, we also have open chat channel and a video channel where we are going to upload the webinar recordings for example 
So this was the introduction of Bioxel and I hope that uh, in future our uh, support will be of use for you. Now I would like to uh, present you uh, Mark Abraham. Some of you probably know him very well from the Gromax mailing list. He is the project manager of uh, Gromax and uh, one of the main developers of the package. Uh, he's, uh, his interests are not only in uh, parallelization, high performance computing, uh, accelerators. Uh, he's also working on uh, clustering sampling methods, replica exchange. Uh, and uh, it's my great pleasure today to give uh, Mark the microphone and uh, he can tell you more about how to make the best out of Gromax. So, Mark, could you start? Thank you for that introduction, uh, Rotten. Um, I am the uh, Gromax Development Manager based here at the, the Royal Technical Institute in sunny Stockholm, um, where we have a lot of the um, development of Gromax taking place. Gromax itself is a, a classical molecular dynamics package that um, targets a, a lot of problems that are uh, of interest to people in the, the biomolecular simulation community. Um, it is a free and open source uh, C++11 uh, community project that is, is developed by researchers at multiple institutions um, and gets used by hundreds of research groups around the world, which is um, wonderful because they are able to, to cite the, the, the papers that, that we um, produce so that they have reliable molecular simulation methods. And that in turn allows uh, lots of funding agencies to recognize the, the value that we're able to deliver uh, to lots of you for doing your science um, who've been uh, loyal supporters of us over the years with funding. Um, here on screen we, we see a, a typical Gromax uh, simulation uh, target system. This is a Glick ion channel, which is one of the things we do research on uh, here in, at Koteho in Stockholm. Um, and this, this is a typically challenging kind of um, biomolecular uh, target system. We have a, a protein that's seated inside a, a membrane here, all solvated in, in water, perhaps with uh, a lot of ions, which is very characteristic of uh, the kinds of uh, aqueous solutions we see uh, in, in uh, biomolecular simulation. So this is very challenging for, for people to, to model um, because it has these multiple different parts of, of the system which need different kinds of interactions to be able to model well. Um, and there's even further challenge uh, for the developers to write the code so that it runs well with these different degrees of, of resolution that need to uh, be targeted within the software for the various parts of the system. Um, it's also challenging for the users at the far end to marshal all of these parts together in a way that will allow them to, to run fast to maximize their science output for the amount of computer and human time uh, that they have expended in getting their simulation run. So today's uh, topic is um, Gromax performance optimization and tuning. Before we start, it would be worth considering when does this even matter? In many cases, when one is doing a biomolecular simulation, what one is seeking to do is to do a simulation that runs over a long period of time that generates uh, a number of independent configurations that are expected to be characteristic of the uh, ensemble of confirmations that would be sampled in real life. Um, however, we can only do a finite length of simulation. So we, we need to push that length of simulation as far as we can so that the number of independent configurations we are able to sample is as large as possible for the amount of computational resource we expend. So it makes sense to try to get as many samples as possible for that amount of uh, computer time that you have available. By default, um, if you just run Gromax's simulation engine MD-RUN, you will get pretty good performance. Um, you shouldn't bother trying to improve that if you're just starting out with Gromax. You should be focusing on, am I doing a, a valid, correct model of real simulation, uh, the, the real biochemical system that I'm, uh, I'm trying to model? Um, certainly, if you're only starting out doing tutorials, most of what I'm saying you should go in the back of your mind for later when you're running a, a very large set of simulations over a lot of hardware. Um, but when you're starting out, um, you 
don't really want to, to bother with this. You should also consider not bothering if you have something else useful that you can go and do while your simulation runs. If nobody else is tapping you on the shoulder wishing to use the hardware after you. Um, this does unfortunately require a bit of human time uh, to compare the performance of different kinds of configurations. Uh, and you want to only put time into this if you will get some value back out of it. So you really should bother with performance optimization and tuning if you're running lots of the same kind of simulation, particularly if you're going to run them on the same kind of hardware layout. So if you have access to the same kind of supercomputer with uh, an annual allocation and you're going to be doing lots of variations on the same simulation, it is worth your while finding out how to run uh, MD run uh, with high efficiency uh, for the kind of simulation you want to run. Unfortunately, that means it'll be different from how somebody else in your lab or somebody else uh, running on an, in your lab on different hardware or someone on the other side of the world is able to run their Gromax simulation. So you won't find good resources for how to run your simulation well. You are going to have to look at what you are simulating and how your hardware works um, in order to try and get the, the last tens of percent of performance uh, out of that um, set of things that you have to manage. You definitely want to bother to do this if your resources that you're running on cost you more money than your time costs. That's for you to judge. So there's a few things we need to consider uh, when we're um, planning to run a, a molecular simulation with Gromax. Um, and that will include things like how we built the, the uh, software that we are going to run, uh, what kind of thing we're going to simulate, what kind of physical model uh, that we're going to try and use for our simulation, um, some details of how Gromax works on the inside, which will make sense for trying to work out what sort of hardware we should use, um, how we express uh, to Gromax what hardware we're running on, um, and how to get feedback on what we're going to do to, to try to improve over. The first step uh, we should think about is that we definitely want to be building the most recent version of Gromax. Uh, if you had an ongoing uh, simulation study that was started with an old version of Gromax, that can be reasonable to continue uh, with that version of Gromax. However, if you are updating to newer hardware, you need to bear in mind that Gromax was optimized to run well on the hardware that existed at the time it was written. If you're using Gromax 4.5, which was released about six years ago, much of the hardware that is currently being sold wasn't even thought of back then. So you, you will not be able to get anything like good performance. Uh, so you should consider that your scientific continuity might be higher uh, if you're able to generate more samples than if you used the same literal version. So having chosen the, the version of Gromax uh, that you wish to run, you should definitely consult the install guide for all of the different versions. Um, you are able to download the, the PDF of this presentation from uh, the BioExo website. Um, if so, and you've done this, you'll be able to click on a lot of the, the HTTP links that are in my talk, uh, which will take you to the, the, the websites and various resources that will allow you to get more background information um, and, and detail that I won't have time to, to cover in, in all, the, all, all the short period of time we have today. So do, do check out the install guides and, and have a read. Uh, you don't need to read all of it the first time you, you install Gromax. Um, you do, however, want to, to consider it if you are actually trying to get the most out of you know, your version of Gromax. You do want to try and use the most recent and preferably the very latest version of all of your infrastructure. You will need a C++ compiler. For example, GCC um, or Intel's compiler are, are our go-to choices. Um, you should really be using the, the very latest versions of those you can possibly get your hands on. Um, our general experience is that GCC does outperform Intel by a little bit, um, but if, for example, you're running simulations on Intel's accelerators, that's where Intel's compiler shines, so we certainly support both of them. If you're wanting to run on um, GPUs, for example, you will also need a CUDA or OpenCL toolkit along with the appropriate software development kits. In the case of CUDA, if you have uh, the latest Tesla generation GPUs or Quadro cards, uh, you will also want uh, their so-called GPU development kit, so you can take advantage of, of NVML, uh, which uh, is a, a very good tool for permitting the GPUs to change their own clock speeds so that they can take advantage of the time when we're not using the GPUs to allow them to cool and to, to overheat during the times when we are using them. Uh, if you haven't got the GDK, you won't be able to take advantage of that. You also want the latest uh, drivers and so on installed on your um, machines so that you, you can have the best of all the worlds. Similarly, MPI libraries, you want to use something fairly recent. Um, they have better support for everything, um, the better they are. 
one of the key pieces of infrastructure Gromax needs to do the simulations that it typically does uh, is a fast Fourier transform library. Um, the state of the art there um, is, is the so-called fastest Fourier transform in the West package uh, from some researchers at MIT. Uh, Intel's MKL is also pretty good. Um, so if you are using the, the Intel compilers, um, by all means, uh, you can link with MKL. There's instructions for that uh, in our install guide. You do want to build FFTW somehow. Um, typical installs don't always have both of the support for SSE2 and AVX um, or the typical kinds of uh, hardware that people run Gromax simulations on. So you want to configure that appropriately. If, however, you don't want to worry about those details, we have a, a facility within Gromax that will build uh, our own version of FFTW um, during the Gromax build uh, the way we think will be best for, for your hardware. So please, please do take advantage of that and simplify your life. If you want to run Gromax on a multi-node cluster, perhaps a supercomputer, uh, then you will want to build with MPI uh, support enabled. Um, however, if you're only going to run on your desktop or maybe on single nodes of your departmental cluster, for example, you would only want to build the, the default non-MPI version. So this, this does enable by default a thing we call thread MPI, um, which plays much the same role as MPI, but doesn't require that you have a bunch of external software installed and organized. Um, you will also need uh, a non-MPI version if you're running some of the PME tuning I'm going to talk about later, um, as well as for doing any of the pre- and, and post-processing. So particularly if you're a, a system administrator at a, at a large cluster or, or a supercomputer, if you want to support your users well, then you should think about installing both an MPI version and a non-MPI version um, so that they have the, the right tool at the job when they need it. Gramax does have the option to build both in its default mode, which uses a mix of single and double floating point precision. Uh, you do have the option of building Gromax fully in double precision, uh, which if you're a system administrator, you might also consider making available. Um, but as a, uh, as a user, uh, you should only choose to, to use that if you really know why it is that you want to do it. There's only a very small minority of, of Gromax simulations that actually benefit from it. You won't be able to run with GPUs, and you will run about a factor of two slower uh, for choosing this option. Uh, so please, please do that wisely. Getting a simulation to run fast starts very, very early in the, the simulation process. You do want to choose a box for your simulation that's just the right shape and just large enough for you to do your science well uh, using the model physics uh, that, that you are doing. If you are modeling a, a small protein folding um, that's approximately spherical, you would really like your simulation cell to be approximately spherical as well. So Gromax has support for a wide range of simulation cell shapes. Uh, ranging from cubic all the way through to general triconic cells that allow us to do rhombic dodecahedra, which are the smallest uh, uh, shapes that can tessellate over 3D space uh, in a way that allows you to use periodic boundary conditions uh, to replicate your system uh, to fill all the space in, in a way that's both physically valid and very efficient to simulate. You also want to think when you're preparing your system topologies about the use of virtual sites. Uh, this is a, a key performance feature available uh, only with Gromax, um, that allows uh, us to treat uh, group, chemical groups such as methyl and amino side groups um, that uh, have a couple of uh, nearby hydrogen atoms in a, in a methyl group, for example, um, to treat that as a rigid body so that when we are doing our force calculations, we treat all of the, uh, the atomic sites as, as fully interacting. But then when we go to do the update, we project the forces on those, uh, the, all four of the, the, the atoms in the, the methyl group, uh, down to uh, a smaller number of interactions, which allows us to take a larger time step in the update before projecting those back for, for the next time step. So there are other MD packages out there that, that do quite different schemes for allowing you to, to push the outer time step out to about four cents a second. Um, but uh, the, the use of virtual sites is, is the way Gromax uh, currently encourages uh, people to take, take best advantage of uh, the code that we have that allows you to generate more independent samples uh, of your system faster. In order to use virtual sites, you also need to plan to use links with all bonds constraints for your uh, bonded interactions. If you're not prepared to use virtual sites, or perhaps they're not yet supported for your force field, um, then you also want to consider using links and constraints only over all hydrogen bonds. If you do that, you can use typically a two femtosecond time step. You don't have any constraints at all, however, you'll need to go down to one or probably half a femtosecond time steps uh, 
in order that your um, simulation remains stable um, and is actually modeling the real world. Um, do be aware, however, that typical water models are rigid. Um, and they are optimized within Gromax using an algorithm called CEPL. Um, so if you do read some, some older papers or some other simulation packages, it will talk about the use of check, which is implemented in Gromax, um, but it's much harder to parallelize than the algorithms like Lynx. So Lynx is, the, is entirely equivalent to check. And, and is the way we, we are able to deliver you the, the performance that the Gramex can do. There are many different kinds of water models out there. Um, most of the available biomolecular force fields were parameterized with some of the three site water models in mind. Um, there are four and five site models out there that um, have been demonstrated to have some interesting properties that might occasionally be useful. Um, do feel free to consider using those. They're, they're supported in Gramex. But remember that you are paying for some, some extra work there. Typically, tip 4 p will be about 10% slower than tip 3P. Um, so you want to do that if you think you're getting value for that. Another good tip uh, is that you want to consider orienting your simulation box with load balancing in mind. Uh, you need to um, think about the fact that Gromax is going to have to chop up your simulation cell into chunks in, in 3D space that will, will be able to be sent to different uh, bits of computers to be calculated on. That works best uh, if you orient uh, your system such that the default in Gromax, which is to provide all long planes perpendicular to the z-axis, will eventually lead to um, low balancing. So here in the case of the click iron channel, here we have the z-axis vertically. Uh, we are able to resize the, the, the boundaries between our domains. It's taken advantage of the fact that the membrane has a different density of work than our, our aqueous domain. So that's what I love that. that. You have a wide pipe of have some problems with the sound. Uh, Mark, you okay. change, it became very choppy and um, like robotic. Could, it, mm, no, it still sounds the same. Do, do you want to try to reconnect okay. maybe? Um, Nothing's changed on my end, unless it's a, a network effect. Um, that won't help. Yeah. Uh, I can try reconnecting if you want. That'll that'll yeah. delay things a minute or two. Though. Yeah. Could could you try just to reconnect? Maybe right. it might improve for some reason. Okay. Be right back. Um. Uh, okay, everyone, until Mark connects uh, back, I would, can everybody hear me now? I would like to show you uh, what we have on the BioXL's uh, website. Uh, it's part of our support structure. If you go to contact, Uh, here you'll see um, their link to support forums. Uh, where we have uh, for the for the three applications for Haddock, Gromax and for CPMD uh, that you could Post questions and we we have also video channel on YouTube where we have the webinars uploaded 
We have GitHub repositories as well. Uh, there's not much stuff there yet, but uh, with time we'll upload new um, code. And we have a Gitter chat channel uh, that is open to everyone. And if sometimes we are online, we can directly um, answer questions. So let's see if Mark is... Uh, Mark? Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm I, I think it's uh, better now. Okay, that sounds so good. Let's uh, change to you. Yeah. Okay. So we should certainly uh, think about um, writing only the output we can actually use uh, from our simulations. Um, that will make lots of stages faster. You don't want to use your temperature and pressure coupling every step, um, but rather uh, just um, you know, uh, multiple of, of 10 or 100 is, is good for choosing your per, per, per time step um, uh, frequencies that, that algorithms act. Um, it is tempting to reduce the, the length of your cutoffs in order to make your simulation run faster. Um, do be very careful not to do that with your Van der Waals cutoffs. They tend to be parameterized into your force field, so a lot of the values of the parameters uh, that uh, describe how the different atoms interact depend very critically on the van der Waals cutoff. So you, you should not vary those from the standard practice of the authors of your force field or other publishers in your field. Uh, you should very much use the, the Gromax default settings for long-range PME. Uh, they've been studied by lots of people and shown to be, to be uh, uh, very good. Just turning those up in some sort of a quest for accuracy tends to slow your simula simulation down for no particular gain. Uh, so don't, don't do that unless you know what you're doing. You might consider PME Order 5 if you're, you're paralyzing um, very heavily. Um, uh, you need to choose appropriate link settings um, to um, make, make sure your simulation runs well. So let's have a look at how Gromax works on, on the inside so that we'll understand how to um, uh, make this, this run well. Typically in an MD step, we have a number of phases that we have to go through uh, to, to see how things work. Um, so we have to, to compute some short-range interactions. Um, so that, that will typically take place over multiple SIMD units within your hardware on multiple different cores running across lots of threads. So we'll have to combine those up. Then we will have to go and do some modeling of things like bonds in your proteins. This would also include things like angles and dihedrals. Combine all of those. Then we have to start doing the long-range PME part, uh, which involves spreading a bunch of uh, particles onto a grid, starting doing a 3D FFT, um, solve those um, using um, the straightforward multiplication stage at this, this point. More, more 3D FFTs back interpolating from our grid to our real coordinates. Coordinating all of those forces together so that we have our atomic forces, then using those, um, perhaps uh, doing the projection out from our, uh, from our atomic interaction sites to our virtual sites, updating our positions um, and velocities using those forces, constraining uh, those updated positions, um, perhaps back projecting to the atomic sites, looping back to the start. So we do this many millions of times over the course of uh, an MD simulation. So th this would be how Gromax looks if you're running on a, on a single uh, MPI rank without uh, a GPU support. However, things get complicated quickly uh, when you try to run on more bits of hardware. When we're running on multiple ranks, now we have, because we have multiple people participating, we have to do communication. and so. This is uh, illustrated with these, these green arrows here, um, which are multiple phases that happen during MD runs run where people have to down tools and talk to each other in order that everybody stays together. So now we want to do our short range work in two different parts because some of it uh, pertains to um, atoms that are also shared with uh, adjacent uh, domains. So we want to do that work first and send those forces off before we start doing our, our short range forces that only our local domain will care about. We'll still need to coordinate those, then do some bonds, then do some PME. But now during PME, we're going to have to do different kinds of communication. Here, we're also going to have to, to talk with, with adjacent um, PME ranks, perhaps. And during the 3D FFT stage, there will be some global communication. This tends to be a big bottleneck as we add lots and lots of ranks. Um, so we'll consider ways of doing this better in a moment. And then we will have the same uh, update phase at the end. And once we've done our update, we'll have to send coordinates to our neighboring ranks 
depending if you have responsibility for what. Because we have to do this global communication stage here, that works much better on, on supercomputers if it is separated onto MPI ranks that are um, of, of a smaller size than you would like to run onto so that you run fast. This greatly complicates how the code works in, internally. Uh, we'll see more about how to run the code uh, using this setting in a minute. Uh, but we now have to have an initial phase where we send the coordinates off to those separate MPI ranks. On our particle-particle ranks, as they now become called, uh, we do our same kind of work. We still have to communicate that locally. We still have to do our bonded work and then get over here to wait for our separate PME ranks to do the same work that, they, that used to be done also on our, our main ranks. Um, but now these guys only do the PME part. This makes this communication phase work a lot more efficiently um, and with much less contention from, for example, busy networks on, on uh, departmental clusters. The downside of doing this is that during the update phase, there's nothing for the PME ranks to do. So that, that's a little bit wasteful, but we gain enough here to pay for that waste there. So this, this is uh, a quite, quite efficient optimization within Gromax. Since Gromax 4.6, we also had support for GPUs, which allows us to offload the big part of the compute, compute work, which are the short-ranged uh, computations, to the GPU. So they run down here on our, on our um, imaginary GPU section uh, of our layout. When the non-local work is done, however, we still need to send that to um, our local ranks. So we have to transfer coordinates over, transfer forces back, send those off to other MPU. Ranks. So we start doing a lot of data transfer, uh, and this is an unfortunate fact of life, that as you start to run Gromax on lots of hardware, it becomes less and less compute bound and more and more communication bound. Uh, so if you're running on small amounts of hardware, you have to squeeze out the most compute performance. If you're running on lots of hardware, you need to think about how your network and your, your transfers uh, take, take uh, time. The GPUs, once they've done the non-local work, can still do the local work and send those back. Um, if we're running on multiple ranks, uh, then after we've got that sent off to, so we can have our communication run in the background, then we can go off and do our PME, coordinate everything, do our update phase. However, the fact of life of only offloading the very compute intensive part is that again, we aren't using our GPUs during all of this phase. So we really want that phase to run as quickly as possible uh, in this scenario. Finally, uh, the, the most complicated layout uh, we could, could imagine is that we're running over lots and lots of, of hardware with multiple MPI ranks. We have separate PME ranks and we're using GPUs. So this, this is the most complicated version to, to try to manage both within the code and, and as a user. Um, but again, we need to set our GPUs doing our, our work and they'll be idle during the update phase. We also need to send our coordinates off to our separate PME ranks so that they can do their separate work. Meanwhile, back on our main, uh, main ranks, uh, CPUs, we are doing our bond interactions, coordinating, receiving the forces from the GPUs and sending them off to other ranks. Maybe we're running idle, which is a bit of a, an irritating thing, because if we only have bonds on some of our domains, for example, where our protein is, we won't have any bonds where our waters are, because of course those are rigid, so we don't actually have any bonds that might vary. So on some MPI ranks, there actually isn't any work to do here. The bonds are zero because they've just got water, so all they can do is wait for the GPUs and send that off and then sit around waiting. Um, so that's frustrating, um, but that's how the current code works. Finally, we coordinate all of the, the the forces back on the main main CPU, do the update, and so on. So again, we might have multiple bits of, of hardware that are lying idle. So how to balance all the workload between all these different compute units um, is something that we do a decent job of within Gromax, but there are some things that you need to be aware of so that you can get the maximum benefit from uh, lots of the good stuff uh, that is within MDRAM. Because we are going to use both the CPU and the GPU, um, you do want to have a well-balanced set of resources there. There's an excellent paper um, produced by uh, some of the core Gromax developers and friends, um, all of whom are supported through, through BioXL. Um, please do go and, go and read that paper. It's called Getting Best Bang for Your Buck with Gromax uh, on GPUs. Um, and it goes through a lot of the details I'm talking about today um, with graphs and presentations and costs of different amounts of hardware and how you want to optimize all these things. I really can't recommend reading that paper strongly enough. It is worth bearing in mind that if you want to scale a Gromax simulation across multiple GPUs, you really are going to want several tens of thousands of particles per GPU. That's pretty commonplace across lots of MD packages uh, that want to run with GPUs. Um, if you're going to run with multiple nodes, then your network needs to be at least gigabit Ethernet, 
and preferably in Finiband. Um, this is so that you have minimal latency of communication. The Gromax needs to send a lot of very small messages, so bandwidth tends not to be important and latency is important. If you're also buying hardware, memory and disk pretty much don't matter. Um, buy whatever seems cheap and effective, especially if you might have other people using your cluster, get whatever is going to suit them. You can certainly run Gromax on resources in the cloud. That's, that's a perfectly good way to, to do things. You do have all to avoid running inside virtual machines because what can happen there uh, is that only, for example, SSE2 um, SIMD units are available on, on the CPU side and that might waste a lot of the capabilities within Gromax for running on more recent versions of hardware. So be, be alert for that one. You'll also get much better value out of your life if you're running on a cluster that's relatively homogeneous. You don't want to have this sort of CPU here and that sort of CPU there. That's just going to make your, your life as a user um, and indeed as a sysadmin um, quite complicated. So if, if you're only running MD run on a single CPU only node, you have a pretty easy time. Uh, if you use the default build, that will be optimal uh, for that. Um, the, de the defaults within MD run will already do a very good job. If you want to explore, um, you, that's reasonable. You might do might get a little bit better. The thing is that you want to do um, is to choose the number of thread MPI ranks um, and the number of open MP threads over which each of those ranks is parallelized so that the total number equals the total amount of threads. Um, Hyper-threading on Intel CPUs can be useful, um, but you're still going to want thousands of particles per core in that case. So choose wisely. If you've got a fairly small system, you might not see any value from hyper-threading. Uh, if you want to know what hyper-threading is, please do check out our excellent uh, user guide uh, on our homepage, which talks about all these details of, of how, how CPUs work um, so that you, you can understand these, these kinds of issues. So if you were running on some node that had 16 cores, which is pretty typical these days, you could run all these different ways of running the same simulation within Gromax. One of these will run faster, and you might want to try all three of them uh, to, to see which one, in fact, gives you the best. There's more examples, again, in our user guide on, on the documentation page. If, however, you're running with a GPU as well as the CPU, you can still use the default mode build, but now you, of course, have to have configured with, with minus D uh, GMX underscore GPU equals on. Um, the MD run defaults, particularly in Gromax 5.1, do a pretty good job of maximizing total resource usage. You do need a number of particle-particle domains that's multiple the number of GPUs on that node. Um, and so this is uh, something that people sometimes get a little bit trapped up on. We see that on the, the Gromax mailing list. Um, but yeah, you, basically because we are offloading the short-range work from a given domain, we need a mapping from domains to GPUs that's fairly straightforward. Again, you might want to vary the number of MPI ranks and the number of threads within those ranks so that that equals the total number of resources you have. Um, and again, M, the number of ranks, has to be a multiple of the number of GPUs. You also might want to send GPU ID appropriately um, because you're going to need to specify indices that say, okay, yes, this the first BP rank should go to GPU 0, so should the second, third, and fourth. But once we get to the fifth rank, we want to use GPU 1 and so on for the next three. You also might want to vary the parameter uh, NST list. Um, you can either do that within your MDB file or on the MD run command line. Um, the default with, with GPUs is, is 50. It does vary a little bit with Gromax version, but you might observe total throughput go up or down a little bit over this sort of range. So you, you might like to, to, to play with those to get maximum throughput. So again, on an over 16 cores, if you also had two GPUs, you might want to vary uh, in these kinds of ways uh, to, to get different throughput. With earlier Gromax versions, you have to be very specific about your GPU ID. With Gromax 5.1 and more recent versions, um, you can get away with um, not, not being as specific. Gromax will work out that 0 and just means it should interpolate into something like this. If you're running MD run across multiple nodes, however, uh, you need to make sure you've built an MBI-enabled version of Gromax. And as I said earlier, Gromax does use the network heavily. Uh, so latency and variability normally limits performance and scaling. You have to share your network with other users. Uh, you aren't going to be able to get full value out of the software engineer that does exist in Gromax. You can maximize what you can do if you are able to request from your job scheduling system that you would like a set of nodes that are very close to each other. You only want one level of your switch network if you have a switch network, or perhaps one level of your Cray Dragonfly uh, network uh, exposed to you, you, your, your set of nodes. And that will limit the exposure you have to the way switch networks are shared between everybody on the machine. Uh, so you, you, if you haven't got 
facility available on your job scheduler, please talk with your system admins and, and see if there are options to get those installed um, because you will get um, much better performance uh, from Gramex if you can do that. You should also consider things, tweaking things within your MPI library about uh, how favorably small messages get transferred. You want minimal overheads, how the MPI library optimizes things and whether they, they copy buffers. How to do that depends widely on the MPI version and, and library. But please also talk with your, your cluster sets. That means they will, they will know lots of secret chips there. Um, as you get to larger numbers of PME ranks, um, you definitely want to use this separate PME rank facility that I talked about earlier. Um, we have a tool within Gromax called GMX Tune PME, uh, which is very useful for this because it is able to optimize over uh, also the, the number of PME ranks, which MDRun itself isn't able to do. Um, performance does tend to be best, however, as a rule of thumb, when you have numbers of MPI ranks for these two um, components that, have, that are composite numbers with lots of common factors. For example, 48 PP ranks and 16 PME ranks tends to work pretty well if you have 64 total ranks. That's because we can have a decomposition that has say, 8 by 3 by 1 in three-dimensional space in PP space and 8 by 2 by 1 in PME space. And the, the cost of communicating within and between these groups of, of ranks uh, is minimal. And as we get to more and more ranks, as I've said, we need to think about our communication more than our co computation. That'll work a bit better than these guys because the common factors are not so good. And common uh, prime factors like 7 and 11 just tend to be pretty bad. So you want to avoid those if you can help it. Um, if you're running on CPU only with multi-node clusters, you need to um, think about a few issues. Now you have to use uh, GMX MPI MD run. Um, you definitely need to, to use this. Um, so, for example, if you're running on four nodes each with 16 cores, there's some alternatives uh, here. We've got more examples of these in, in the Gromax user guide with, with explanations about how these different parameters all work. Um, so what this does is to use the same number of cores for each of these three examples, but we're grouping them together differently. So you'll have different amounts of OpenMP overhead versus MPI overhead, one of these will turn out to be better for your simulation and your hardware in practice. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to get, give general advice, but generally with only CPUs, you, NTOMP 1 or 2 is about as far as you're going to see with, with current hardware and current Gromax. Once you're running on GPUs on multiple nodes, all the previous considerations apply, but stuff gets more complex. Um, you now need to map your PP ranks um, to your GPU IDs in the same way you did with a single node. So you should certainly start there with learning how things work. Um, but you now also need to, to manage the fact that the PME ranks don't use their GPUs. So in this case where we have the same four nodes with 16 cores and two GPUs, it seems very natural to use a layout like this where we have um, 64 total ranks, 16 of which are, are PME. So we have 48 PP ranks left of which there's going to be 12 on each node. So we need to say yes split up those 12 ranks like this. If, however, we use fewer ranks, we're going to get to a situation where eventually we have an unbalanced number of PP ranks per node, which would look like this. That probably won't run very efficiently. Um, there are ways to consider splitting up the way we use OpenMP across different kinds of ranks um, so that we parallelize across OpenMP in an efficient way so that we fill out the number of cores that we have per node and fill out the number of GPUs in a balanced way. How to do this depends very much on the structure of your hardware. So you definitely want to read the, the documentation for your hardware uh, and think about how to do this and perhaps talk with um, us on the, the, the Gromax developer forums uh, and user forums uh, for how to do this. The tool GMX Tune PME is also a very good resource that you want to think about using. It's able to tune the number of PME ranks, uh, which is something MDRun can't do for itself. Uh, there's a few tips and tricks here, um, particularly before Gromax 5.1, uh, this could interact poorly with the way our dynamic load balancing works, so you might want to turn that off in some cases and see if you do better. Um, so Tune PME can optimize over this variable P, which is often very important. Um, you do have a need both an MPI and a non-MPI build available, so talk to your cluster admins for that. Um, this can also work with, with GPUs, but there's only a small number of per, per node layouts that could be useful. So that's not always useful. The best tip for, for running um, with GPUs is that if you need anyway lots of copies of similar simulations and you don't need the result immediately, 
um, then you want to consider running copies of the same simulation on the same hardware so that the time I mentioned earlier when the GPUs are running idle can get used for running another simulation. The easiest way to set this up, and a lot of these details are talked about in the paper I, just, I recommended earlier, um, then uh, you can run um, the MPI enabled version of Gromax using the multi dir feature to say, okay, I want to run these four simulations across those 16 ranks, four ranks per simulation, um, to, sh to share the hardware in a way. Gromax will take care of all the details of doing processor layout, which is really good with the GPUs, um, because we're able to take advantage of the fact that during the time when they would lie idle for one simulation, we can be working on another one. Uh, so this, this tends to work very well, and your, your overall performance per unit time, per unit dollar, per unit watt, whatever is important to you, um, goes up dramatically if you need multiple copies of the same simulation. So people should, should consider that very seriously. Um, this will also look good in your paper because you'll be able to have multiple simulations and, and talk about uh, the variation within those and how converged your simulations are. For actually measuring performance, um, you do want to use the actual production TPI you intend to use. Um, so go and build that and then measure performance with different settings for that. You want to run a few thousand MD steps to permit the tuning and load balance to stabilize then to reset the counters and finally observe performance. So a typical way to do this would be to use the command line option that's really good for benchmarking. You shouldn't do your production simulations using this option. You should set and steps within your MDP file. But for doing performance testing, um, this is very convenient. You want to reset the counters, however, during so that you don't have all of this tuning and load balancing um, polluting the, the final performance uh, that's uh, hopefully uh, quite stable after this amount of time has expired. Uh, so this is a very good way to, to get performance um, that is reasonably reliable because it's already been tuned. There's lots of clues within the log file um, that uh, might be a topic for a future webinar uh, to look at. We're out of time today. Um, but there's a, there's a summary of the hardware and software configuration uh, at the start of the log file. There's also reports on how things got set up. Um, there's analysis of what your time got spent on different parts of the code, how, how efficiently everything was running. If you have got multiple log files because you've tried varying some of the parameters I've been suggesting, you often want to use the Unix tool diff in its side-by-side -side mode to compare different runs to understand where they were different uh, and what kinds of effects they had. Um, so we, we might follow up with that in, in a future webinar. So that, that brings my formal material uh, to a conclusion. So we'll go and take some, some questions now. So hopefully you've been you've been busily asking questions and, and Ross has someone in mind for this person to get the microphone passed to them. Yes, uh, thank you, Mark. So there was um, uh, there is one question from Robin Corey. Uh, Robin, I'm going to give you the mic now. Can you say something? See if we can hear you. Okay, so I will read the question on behalf of Robin. So he's asking about V sites that uh, five to seconds time step are apparently possible. How true is this, and how applicable is this to different biomolecular systems? Uh, yes, certainly five to ten seconds time steps can be used. Um, some people like the, the conservatism that, that, that they feel with four to seconds. I would certainly encourage you to. To do a small simulation on something that's characteristic of, of what you want to observe, um, and observe that in fact there, there's, there's no difference in the quality of your observables between those two. Um, there's a lot more information in a paper from um, uh, Eric Lindahl's group um, that also introduced the Channel 27 port uh, within Gromax that came out about four years ago. Um, but the, the, the observations within that are, are still quite pertinent. You can't go past about five femtoseconds because then subtle vibrations of how water vibrates um, aren't modeled appropriately. Um, so that's that's why sort of four to five times a second is as much you can you can push molecular simulations, whether you're doing that with multiple time stepping regimes or whether you're doing it with virtual sites. So yeah, I certainly do encourage you to, to explore the use of, of five times a second also. That's, that's lunch that you, you may decide um, is, is quite good for you. If you're interested in fine details of kinetic properties, maybe you, you want to consider more carefully how, how far you push that. Depends whether you think the kinetics of amino and methyl groups uh, is, is going to be important. Uh, 
Thanks, Mark. And there is a follow-up question again from Robin, whether there is a performance difference between MPI and Thread MPI. Thread MPI, of course, only works on one node, um, and it is, it is built to work very well on that case. It's a very, very efficient uh, performance implementation on either the native P-threads or WinThreads, whether you're running on, on Unix style systems or Windows style systems. It's intended to be very, very low overhead. You will observe more overhead if you use a first-class MPI on, on a single domain, um, maybe to the, the tune of 10, 20 percent. Um, so if, if you're running, it's also much easier to build and you don't need to have MPI installed uh, to run on a single, single node. So if you're doing a single node, everybody should be doing thread MPI. It's clearly very good. Uh, OK, we have a question by uh, Ramon Krehe. Um, not sure I pronounced correctly the name. Ramon, can you hear us? Mm, we can't hear you. Maybe you could type the question in the question pane. And I will give the mic to. Um, okay. Just a second. Okay, can you hear us? Yeah. Can, okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, regarding MPI tuning, uh, what sizes are those small messages, basically? And, and is there more information on what the, the normal message sizes are? In so the, the, messages are yeah. the messages are really quite small. For example, passing around packets of forces and, and coordinates between um, adjacent ranks on, on the MPI, uh, adjacent PP ranks, for example. We're, we're talking about hundreds of atoms, each of which have, say, three coordinates or positions, each of which might be four floats. So we're really only talking thousands of bytes. Okay. So the, the overhead of sending and setting up the MPI message is absolutely dominant, uh, or the typical kinds of scenarios where people want a strong scale. Uh, run. Similarly, within the, the, the 3D FFT, they tend to be fairly small messages. Yeah, and there are no really large messages anywhere used. No. No. Okay. Okay. And next, we have a question from Siri van Kulen. Siri, can you hear us? You have a couple of questions already. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. We hear you. Okay, um, I had two questions. Um, one about the orientation of the box, uh, uh, the simulation box, because uh, when you were explaining this, um, the sound was a bit unclear. Um, especially if you have a rectangular box, how would you need to orient the box to get um, yeah, optimal cutting of the box uh, for comics? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if, if you had something that was, say, a, a long, thin pipe as, as a shape, um, you would want to end up with domains that are approximately spherical because that means you can have more of the domain. Of course, a long, thin pipe can't become spheres, so you're going to end up with cuboid kinds of things. Um, the default uh, partitioning in the domain decomposition is to split things along planes orthogonal to the z-axis. Um, so you want to set up your simulation system so that x and y are your short dimensions and z is your long dimension. Um, so that okay. when it partitions in planes parallel, uh, it'll get broken up. Is is that the kind of information you were looking for? Yeah. So is that long dimension x y short? Yep. Okay. Thanks. Um, and one more question about the GPUs, because I I am fairly new to the GPUs and I didn't understand um, how you can sort of optimize them on multiple nodes with these ones and the zeros. I didn't understand that part. Could you okay, so the, the, explain it once more, <laughs> perhaps? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'll just come back to this guy. Okay, so G GPU ID uh, is the MD run command line flag that says how to map the GPU IDs from the particle-particle ranks on that node uh, to the GPUs. So here if we have two GPUs, we, we give them ID 0 and 1. 
And because we have eight particle particle ranks, uh, we map those one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight um, to the GPUs starting zero and one. That okay. doesn't change when you go to multiple nodes. The indexing in GPU ID, however, stays within a node. So if you have two identical nodes, each of which has 16 cores and two GPU IDs, you still want to use GPU ID like this to express the mapping from PP ranks within a node to the GPUs within a node. Okay, so, so that... in this example, you, the, the zero and the one stand for two GPUs, and this is just um, how you distribute the, this uh, N TMPI on the... Yes, we, we're going to have eight, um, eight particle particle domains, each of which is an MPI mm -hmm. rank, which here is thread MPI mapped to our GPU so that there are four domains per GPU. Mm -hmm. You could also use zero, 01, zero, 01, zero, 01. That might be faster or slower. You could try them both. Okay, and on the multiple nodes, you said it doesn't change, so, but how... Okay, so you, you still have these two because you have two GPUs in, in the node. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this, okay. this mapping is expressed within the node. So again, because as I very quickly did the maths there, um, we will have 48 PP ranks total, 12 on each node. We need to map 12 PP ranks to our two GPUs. So six zeros and six ones is one way to do that. I just didn't get this, uh, the 48. So because we have chosen 16 PME ranks, oh, okay. 64 total ranks, there'll be 48 left. Yeah, okay. So this, so this can be complex because you end up with um, domain decompositions that have interesting numbers as factors. And as I said in one of the slides, uh, you want to try and choose everything so it's mutually composite. That's very hard to do in the yeah. general case. So with this 48, sorry, could you please? <laughs> Explain that one more time. So you have these 48, and then what do you do? So there's 48 ranks distributed over yeah. the four nodes that we're computing on. Yeah. So there will be 12, 12 of those uh, you know, on each um, okay. node. Uh, so exactly how that happens often means you need to get involved with how your MPI library would like you to express a host file or how your job scheduler wants you to tell it how it, you want the MPI ranks placed. So all, all of that involves talking to your local admins and so on. Um, mm. we, we can help with general principles, but the details are the details. Um, so yeah, there will be 12 of those on each of your nodes, and by expressing zeros and six ones for GPU ID, MDRun will understand that you want those 12 ranks to be mapped, the first six to GPU zero and the next six to GPU one. Mm. Okay. Um, another thing that GPU ID is useful for is if you're running on a desktop and you might have one GPU that is useful for your display and other GPUs that you actually want to compute on, um, the using GPU ID allows you to skip a GPU that you don't want to use because it's underpowered. Uh, oh. You do much better if you use just the two compute ones, for example. Thanks. Okay. okay uh, thank you. Yes, and uh, so since Ramon couldn't uh, crack by the microphone, he wrote the the question in the questions. So his question is about uh, checking the combinations of NTOMP, NTMPI, and NST list. Uh, particularly, the question is like, should we try all these combinations with all possible NST options? Are they coupled? What's the what's the best way to optimize? Um, so those. Uh, you do, of course, want to choose the number of ranks and the number of presidents ranks so that you keep all of the cores busy. So that's that's the, the set of space over which to, to optimize there. So this, this is what we're expressing here. Um, the NST list is something you might vary with, and, it, and again, you can see the same kind of variation going on. Um, um, the NST list, however, is independent of all those degrees of freedom. Um, you will, however, want to be able to. So we, Mark, we are getting again problems with the sound. 
and it's actually five o'clock already. Uh, so I suggest we stop here. There's still uh, questions uh, asked, and uh, we'll see what we could do. Maybe uh, we can do another session uh, in future that we uh, focus more extensively on questions, uh, or like at the same time. Uh, Everybody is welcome to post questions on uh, BioXL's uh, website on the ask.bioxl.eu uh, and uh, we, we can follow up with those questions there. Uh, uh, I would like also to tell everyone about our next webinar in the series. Uh, Mark, could you show the slide? Yes? So our next webinar is in two weeks and it's on atomistic molecular dynamics setup with MD Web. Uh, this webinar will be more for uh, novice users who are not so uh, experienced in the, in the area. Uh, this uh, MD Web software is developed in uh, Barcelona and it's a, a web interface very easy to use. So if you have colleagues who uh, some students or people who are just starting with molecular dynamics simulations, uh, this would be very useful for them. And uh, yes, we'll have more webinars coming in future. Uh, also, free energy calculations. We are planning one webinar in about a month's time. This will be also advertised on the website. I encourage everyone to subscribe to our mailing list and newsletter. On bioxcel.eu, you see a form in the footer or in the right column of sub pages. Uh, subscribe there and you'll get notified for future events. Uh, I'm sorry we had some uh, problems with the uh, sound quality. Uh, I, I hope it was useful for everyone. There will be a recording of the webinar on the website, which uh, you can go over. The slides are also there. And uh, based on the questions, we can. Uh, plan for some future events. So thank you today. Mark, thank you very much for the uh, very useful and nice talk. And I hope uh, we'll see everyone again online. Thanks for today.